Good evening. I'm Bill Sobzak, and I'm speaking to you from my office at College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Today I'll be talking to you about the role of inland waters in the global carbon cycle. Let's start by looking at a diagram that probably many of you have seen before, or at least a similar diagram. This diagram depicts some of the key features of the global carbon cycle. And I'd hi like to highlight uh, two of those. First of all, it shows the role of human activities and potentially the role of human activities in changing the global carbon cycle. It also divides the biosphere into two parts, a land mass and a marine environment or ocean environment. And I put a question mark next to the title because there's an important element missing, and that's the role of inland waters. Here's a different depiction of the global carbon cycle. It's a bit more quantitative. The units are in pedograms of carbon, or grams of carbon times 10 to the 15. I'd like to highlight one of the arrows, and I've highlighted it with a box. And that box has the term erosion. Let's think right now about what that means. Erosion is all the materials that have moved from the continents to the world's oceans. And that organic matter, we can think of it as one pedogram roughly, 0.8 pedograms, or one pedogram roughly, of organic matter moving from the continents to the world's oceans. That may seem like a small number compared to some of the other numbers in this depiction of the carbon budget. But I want you to focus in on the difference between terrestrial photosynthesis and respiration. And to help you focus in on this, I've written in text, total photosynthesis minus respiration equals net ecosystem production. It's the amount of carbon terrestrial ecosystems store or lose over a year. If we look at the difference in this conceptual diagram, we see the difference is two pedograms of carbon. And what this model argues is that the world's terrestrial ecosystems are storing roughly two pedograms of carbon per year. That's the positive net ecosystem production. When we think of that in regards to, in regards to two pedograms, the one pedogram of erosional loss then becomes a much more significant term. And I'll talk more about that. A landmark paper published in 2007 tried to put inland waters into the global carbon cycle context. This paper truly attempted to try to plumb the global carbon cycle and asked, should we be integrating inland waters into how we're conceptualizing and quantifying the global carbon budget? In this cartoon, I take some of the elements of the previous cartoon. The GPP stands for gross primary production, and the R stands for respiration. And we can think of the difference in those two terms as net ecosystem production. What the paper by John Cole and others does is ask, are there fluvial losses of organic materials and carbon materials from terrestrial ecosystems? And we can think of that in regards to the transport arrow. And then we're also going to ask, are the world's inland waters active areas for metabolism of organic carbon and potentially the movement of carbon from waterways to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide? That's highlighted in this cartoon as net gas flux. Lastly, we'll ask, could inland waters serve as sites for collecting organic matter during sedimentation processes? This diagram is found in the Cole et al. paper, Plumbing the Carbon Cycle. And they rely on two models. The first model they refer to as the passive pipe model. And I want you to look at the output term next to the word ocean in that model. It's 0.9, 
the units are pedograms. And for teaching purposes, think of that as roughly one pedogram. So this term is consistent with that found in the previous conceptual model. And it's thought to be a relatively well-established value in regards to the global carbon cycle. If we assume that inland waters have no active role in transforming carbon as it moves from the continents to the world's oceans, then we can also assume that 0.9 petagrams of carbon entered these systems. Keep in mind the value that I said in the previous slide that terrestrial net ecosystem production is roughly 2 petagrams of carbon annually. In the literature, the values range. And so in the Cole et al. paper, they've argued between 1 and 4 petagrams of carbon per year. There's a second model, though, referred to as the active pipe model. And this model is certainly gaining traction in the literature. The active pipe model assumes that inland waterways are not only moving materials from continents to ocean, but are very active in the processing of those materials. I highlight two terms here that need to be included. CO2 evasion, carbon that's broken down in inland waters and loses or leaves the system as carbon dioxide or as a gas, and storage. Once again, the units are in pedograms. If indeed the world's inland waters are active pipes, and we know that there's roughly 0.9 or 1 petagrams of materials entering the world's oceans, then the input term must be significantly higher. And the Cole et al. paper argued it may be as high as 1.9 or 2 petagrams. In the next two slides, we'll talk about the mechanisms that are at play in the active pipe model. So we can think of this as more of, or less of a pipe, but more of an active series of aquatic ecosystems. Let's start with this diagram in which there's a pipe with arrows up and down. And I'm going to introduce several different terms. When we think about the organic carbon or the carbon that enters from terrestrial ecosystems and groundwater from the continents into our inland waters and into streams and rivers, we can think of it moving in four different forms. DIC, or dissolved inorganic carbon, and that can include the gas, carbon dioxide, but also solutes such as bicarbonate. We can think of it moving as dissolved organic carbon, particulate organic carbon, and particulate inorganic carbon. When the organic carbon is metabolized by microbes, CO2 is generated. And when these inland waters become supersaturated in carbon dioxide, it evades or fluxes out of the ecosystem. When materials are converted into particulates, such as POC or PIC, it can be susceptible to sedimentation. It can be trapped in sediments or trapped behind barriers, such as dams. I've also placed these gray arrows in a circular spiraling fashion. And this is to reinforce that these inland waterways are very active hotspots for carbon cycling, in which there's numerous transformations between and among these groups of carbon molecules. We think of the materials moving through streams and rivers out towards the ocean as lateral flux. And we think of the carbon dioxide moving into the atmosphere as the vertical flux of carbon, or vertical CO2 flux. The second diagram looks or examines inland waters in a little bit greater detail to look at the mechanisms that might account for these transformations of different forms of carbon. Note the box allotment carbon. Allotment carbon would be all the carbon that enters aquatic ecosystems from terrestrial ecosystems or external to the system. Autochthonous means carbon that's produced, organic carbon produced within the system, say via photosynthesis. These sources of carbon are reactive, are occasionally processed by microbes, and in the process, 
some of those molecules end up moving into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Some of the materials can form particulates and move into the sediments. There's also processes that are physical in nature that can influence these processes. I've highlighted the role of incoming solar radiation, which is known to help degrade certain organic molecules. And I've also highlighted the sorption dynamics that occur as sediments mix and mingle with these different modes or forms of organic matter. The red box in the upper right highlights the net or total impact of these processes. Frequently, we think of aquatic ecosystems as being either heterotrophic, in that they're using more carbon than they're sequestering or taking up, or autotrophic, in which they're taking up more carbon from the atmosphere than they're um, moving to, to the atmosphere. The world's streams and rivers are routinely net heterotrophic ecosystems. In other words, they're routinely evading carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Another way of thinking about this is the world's inland waters, streams, and rivers are routinely supersaturated in carbon dioxide. That supersaturation of carbon dioxide reflects the constant processing of a lochthanous carbon. So this will be the third of the series of conceptual models I showed you of the global carbon cycle. And I think it's a more representative perspective. This cartoon, which was found in an article published in Nature by Bettine and others in 2007, was an additional landmark paper in our thinking about the role of inland waters in the global carbon cycle. And I think that this is, this is an accurate depiction in that the role of terrestrial ecosystems, inland freshwater ecosystems, and marine ecosystems receive equal billing in regards to their role in the transformation and conversion of carbon globally. In the five years since John Cole's paper, Plumbing the Global Carbon Cycle, and Bettine and et al.'s paper on the boundless carbon cycle was published, there's been an immense amount of research. This is a vibrant frontier area of ecosystem science and environmental science in general. And I've highlighted several high-profile papers to give you a feel for some of the papers that now are impacting our field. These would all be useful papers to read in advance of your journeys to the Colima River this summer. So we now appreciate the importance of streams and rivers in our thinking of the global carbon cycle. What we are now doing is starting to explore parts of the planet in which streams and rivers and drainage networks have been less studied. And an important portion of the planet is the northern hemisphere and the polar region. Here I highlight two rivers, the Colville River and the Yukon River. Both are in Alaska, and both are important areas of studying carbon cycling and trying to quantify the role of inland waters in both lateral and vertical fluxes of terrestrial derived carbon. As we move into high latitudes and polar regions, we're also beginning to appreciate the role of small lakes, which are quite numerous at high latitudes and the role of land-water interfaces, which are a common feature across the landscape. This summer, you'll have the opportunity to explore carbon cycling questions in the Coloma River Basin as part of your Polaris Project efforts. The Colma River Basin is noteworthy for several reasons, some of which were touched on by Max Holmes in the talk last week. It's a major river 
draining to the Arctic Ocean. It's been relatively poorly studied compared to some other larger major rivers in the world. And it's a watershed that's underlain by continuous permafrost and permafrost that we know to be rich in carbon reserves. An important question to ask is if the planet is slowly warming and much of this permafrost is starting to melt or become exposed to temperatures that allow it to succumb to fluvial processes, how might the active pipe model for the Colima River be able to incorporate these new fresh inputs of permafrost? The Polaris project works with international teams of scientists to address this issue. The unifying scientific theme of the Polaris project is to study the transport and transformations of carbon and nutrients as they move with water from terrestrial uplands to the Arctic Ocean. Note in this Landsat image of the Colima watershed the myriad of aquatic ecosystems. And note the strategic location of Chersky, where the Polaris project is based, to exploring these different style and types of aquatic ecosystems. This concludes my portion of today's presentation, in which I focused in on the global carbon cycle. The next speaker, John Shade, will be focusing in on nitrogen and phosphorus cycling. We think of the study of the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles together as the study of coupled biogeochemical cycles. And this is another emerging frontier area in environmental science. Thank you for your time this evening. John Shade will be answering questions. Thank you.